that so in this governor session uh, i want to cover some of the topics we we discussed last session about last session we explained again our structure and then how we doing the normal governance and then we also last time we said who, who uh, disclosed finance which we already did so we will do the quick recap but uh probably we'll spend like a less than half of the time uh, covering uh what we already disclosed then uh we want to focus the last half more into this grant style idea uh we published uh, recently and i did invite a couple of the dao expert from different dao communities so i'd like to uh, ask them to share their kind of experience okay and then just for the org structure uh, just for people who don't who are not familiar with the how ens runs uh we'll, we have a company non-profit company called true names limited it's based in singapore and it has like several members i think four of us are working full-time and other people working part-time and we are kind of doing day-to-day -day, uh development and uh, business development but at the same time we have a uh, multi-stakeholders who basically uh, own the rights to change anything on the top level domain and we have seven holders uh i think two holders uh, martin and the sergey change joined the last one year but most of the, the others have been the multi six signer since he started back in 2017 and the nick is the only one who belongs to both Mount Sig and the true names. And you can actually see, yeah, uh, the contract address if you go to mountsig.ens.is. And uh, <clears throat> also the activity of the Mount Sig, you can actually see thanks to Gnosis Safe. And uh, I I don't actually have no visibility on how what Mount Sig does, but like I can verify on chain that there was no activity for the last six months. But now there is two pending uh, changes. That one is about I think uh, Brownlee briefly touched that. Like we we doing the uh, we partnering with the DNS auction, and uh, I think Brownlee mentioned that that's going to be represented as a, a DNS top TLD twenty three TLD as an NFT, and uh, Nick wrote a smart contract which represents that. So, so the first one is to add that as a controller, which I only figure out by looking at the controller smart contract address and reading, reading the name, oh, that's what that is. And the second one is we, it, when we register names, currently you, minimum commitment age is, I saw it's max. Oh yeah. So a uh, max, like if you don't uh, complete the three steps within 24 hours, uh, you have to start from over again, which causing a problem for people who don't know, who are fam not familiar with small steps. So we, I actually propose like we should make it longer to one week. So that the, there are two, two uh, things which actually change our contract behavior and uh, needs us a uh, full sign up from the seven months to owners. So that's what I, I think Nick kicked off uh, a couple of days ago and waiting for the sign. -up. And uh, for the finance, again, I don't talk through everything, but because it's already published, uh, but we basically, I think, have about $20 million worth of, uh, $70 million, sorry, a dollars worth of uh, ETH or USD uh, in either True names holdings uh, money, or it stays in the mouth stick, or it's in a controller which collects all the registration fee. And uh, for the roadmap, uh, again, this is also posted on the discussion forum that our we talked about like five different. Uh, focus this year that dns integration which currently already mentioned and l2 uh, nick's going to mention uh, in the next session and also about, I, I think we, we had a couple of discussion that like is root mouse basically has a superpower to override any subdomain so uh 
we had a way to restrict that power and it's currently i think in an audit review but a certain point uh we should be able to do this uh nick do you have any timeline or, or for this locking control dot is you're muted thank you easy to forget uh the audit by consensus diligence is due in the middle of may uh, and so once that's completed and assuming they don't find anything new for the previous audit, uh, then we would anticipate asking key holders about that uh, same month. Um, so I think it's worth expanding on this a little bit. Um, the idea here is that the root contract, which is what actually owns the ENS root uh, directly, um, has a facility to permanently lock out control of a particular top level domain. So once you toggle this bit for that top level domain, even the ENS multisig can no longer make changes to it, uh, meaning that uh, they could no longer replace the .eth registrar contract with anything else. Um, and that would mean in turn that uh, ENS registrations and renewals would be uh, entirely permanent. There would be no way for the multisig to, to exercise any control over them. Um, and I think that's an important step in the direction of decentralization. Um, the multisig would still have the power to change how registrations and renewals are conducted. Um, but once you have registered a domain for, say, a year or 10 years or 100 years, there would be no way for anyone, including the multisig, to change that registration or, or delete it or uh, affect it in any way, um, which I think would be a really important step to showing that ENS truly is a decentralized naming system. Um, and I'd be curious to hear from from others on the call too uh, what your thoughts are on this and whether it's uh, a good step, whether this is a good time to be taking it. Uh, I think we think that the registrar contract is mature and stable enough that this is uh, an acceptable risk, uh, but I'd be very interested to hear other people's feedback on that. And sorry to slightly interrupt your uh, presentation, Makoto. No, that's fine. Uh, yeah, sorry. To, uh, yeah, feel free to interrupt. Like, I just put agenda, but like this can change as we go along. Any questions? Or yeah, including this one and any other things we've mentioned, I cover so far. Are there any questions, comment? Yeah, no? Makoto, can you can you stop screen sharing? Um, just if you're if you're looking at the, I'm just looking at myself here. <laughs> sure. Yeah, and uh, a key thing for me too was that um, there are big question marks around layer twos and how Ethereum is scaling and blah blah blah, and we don't want to lock ourselves into something that that shuts us off from that. But Nick, you were telling me the other day that even if we lock the current .eth registrar contract, we could still actually even migrate the .eth namespace itself to a layer two if we wanted to. Uh, yes, so you know we'll go into more detail in the L2 conversation, but uh, the way we're looking at doing L2 integration at the moment involves the resolver rather than the uh, the ownership of the name. Um, we would be it would limit our our options, but the way we're looking at it presently would still work. Uh, the way effectively it, what 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 it would do is it would mean that you could uh, register a name on L2, and then. Uh, choose to push it to L registration in L1 if you if you wanted, at which point you would benefit from all the guarantees of, of the inability for anyone to, to interfere with it in any way. Yeah, and then uh, another key thing in my mind is that this is true for all blockchain <laughs> things, of course, is what's permanent is that smart contract and that system, but insofar as the value of ENS is ultimately in its network, if there, even if there, if there was later after we locked it, some catastrophic bug, like worst case scenario, the, the always fallback is, well, we just redeploy the whole system, spend an absurd amount of gas setting everything up, copying all records over, and every single service in the world just starts using the new thing, right? This is like always the backup. Um, although, of course, we want to avoid that as much as possible. Yeah, I think uh, we did that like about a year ago because we did actually we did. have the bug. And I think it was current gas price and the ease, it's going to become like almost close to a million or over a million. So that's really, really like the last result, I think. Yeah, and we, we wouldn't be suggesting uh, doing this if we didn't think that the, 
the registrar was stable and that's why we're waiting for an additional audit before we propose it to the key holders. And I would say if you're a hacker type and you're in, if you're the type of person that once we lock it would think, hmm, let me start looking for bugs, I would recommend looking for bugs now. Um, do you guys have a bug bounty open for people of that type? We don't have a formally written up one. Um, we uh, previously were covered by the Ethereum Foundation's one, but that's no longer the case. Uh, we would be uh, delighted to pay similar rates for, for bugs found in ENS, I think, and that's something we should formalize. Uh, Ulrich had his hand up. Yeah, I just wanted to say that this redeployment thing, <laughs> uh, that might be feasible right now, but if what we, I think, everybody in this call believe that this is going to take off, that becomes more and more unfeasible. Correct. I, that is just, that will, I, yes. I mean, when, once it is in real use, that will be impossible to do. Uh, and and yes. at that point, <laughs> yeah. So I'm, uh, I feel a little bit hesitant to, 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 to lock things up uh, and say, we can change this in the future. I think I, I see why you would want to do it, but I would say, do you really think this technology is so mature that we don't need to make changes in the future? Um, I, so I think that uh, there's, there's two factors here. One is that we are very confident in the, the implementation of the current registrar. The other is that the contract that would be locking in stores all of the registration data and any change to it would already require a major migration. Um, you know, one that's not that much smaller than the, the ENS migration in general. So um, I think the chances of a, a bug or an issue that is serious enough to warrant that migration, but not serious enough to warrant an all of ENS migration is quite low. I mean, Ulrich, you bring up a good point, which is that it's not like, oh, migrations are easy and they get, they aren't, and they get increasingly more difficult over time, which is good, by the way, because that helps to solidify ENS uh, so to to do a migration, the, the bar for doing a migration in the future gets higher and higher and higher. Um, all, all I'm saying is that when we say locked, that I'm just saying that, like, is anything really totally locked, depending on how you think about it? That's all I'm saying. But you're right. We do need to be careful with it. OK. Uh, any other questions before I get back to the slide? Yeah, just, just quickly there. Um, so, I guess like what are the other options uh, to locking them? One is obviously just keep things as they are, uh, but then are there is, is like another option to kind of broaden the, the the scope of whatever mechanism is governing it uh, to something uh, more decentralized uh, or, um, or or something like that. You know, like it, right now it seems like it's this kind of binary choice, but it seems like there's potentially other options. Uh, I guess yeah, what's so to consider. It's broadly speaking orthogonal in that uh, we can, this lock flag can be set by whoever controls the root and the root can be controlled by, you know, whoever's uh, suitable effectively. So this is one decision we're looking at. The other thing, to, other, uh, another thing to discuss is, uh, you know, decentralization of, of governance in general. Um, which is also something we, that's a, a valuable conversation to have. I guess the um, the reason to bring this up first is that if the multisig can no longer replace the root, then the threats from the multisig, whatever form, or sorry, the threats from the owner of the root, um, are much reduced. You know, they can still perform useful functions, but they're less susceptible to capture and they're less, uh, you know, less concern uh, in other areas uh, than they are at present. So. Uh, you know, we, we definitely want to talk about in the session for that matter about things like, um, you know, potential decentralized governance mechanisms. Um, but there are a bunch of levers in ENS and we can talk about how each of them should be decentralized rather than just, we'll just hand everything over to this DAO or something like that. Um, and I think a valuable, personally, I'm in favor of, um, of removing uh, human control where it's viable to do so 
over handing it to a different set of humans who hopefully will be nicer than the current set of humans. Um, you know, that there are definitely areas that will always need some degree of oversight. For instance, uh, pricing is done via USD oracles, which have a tendency to change from time to time. Um, and there's not really any way any getting around that at the moment. Um, on the other hand, the ability to affect pricing is much less dangerous than the ability to, you know, erase existing registrations. Um, so I think sort of progressive decentralization and looking at each individual role and how we can decentralize that is probably the best way to handle it. Yeah, I think that makes sense. Oh, you're muted, Makoto. Sorry, okay, I'll get back to this slide. Yeah, so we talk about, yeah, so locking control over the ETH. And uh, yeah, we have our UI uh, has fast design, like I think two, three years ago, and it's evolved as more features are added. And then I think some area it's hard to use. So we are kind of revise, uh, revising the whole UI and we might have, might do kind of, yeah, you might make over. And the last bits about the ENS wrap, but it, it's kind of kick, uh, suggest, yeah, the last workshop that we have this subdomain, uh, do, domains like it, anyone can kind of start minting new domain and, and that can be the better if we can extend the way what turning into NFT would be good. So then I think uh, Nick and Jeff started working on extending and it start evolving and it keeps evolving, but I don't, I don't know, Jeff or Nick, do you want to do, want to measure quickly what you guys are doing? Yeah, I can do, I can say a few things. Yeah. So I think the basic idea behind the uh, NFT wrapper is to, initially it was to allow um, subdomains to be created and initially to be wrapped as an NFT so they could be compatible with OpenSea and any other platform that wants to use ERC-71. So currently only the .eth names are NFTs. So that would allow subdomains to also be NFTs. And as we were building the subdomain registrar, we realized that actually this functionality of wrapping them into NFTs um, is quite useful. So we could maybe have it as a standalone module and also be able to wrap <laughs> DNS names because um, even though DNS names, DNS sec names may not be transferable, they'd be useful to see in your wallet to, to see that you've got these names. And then that evolved into, if we did it as a subdomain registrar, um, we would need some way of uh, kind of ensuring that these subdomains can't be like reassigned. So we've built this kind of fuse system where once you wrap a name, you can essentially burn permissions on it. So you can burn the ability to set new subdomains or replace new subdomains. So if you're doing a subdomain registrar, you could burn the ability to unwrap the name and burn the ability to um, uh, replace subdomains. So it could issue new subdomains, but it could never take away subdomains from you. So this is the kind of basic idea behind this smart contract. Cool, thank you. And let me... Yeah, can I just quick. mention one other thing on that? Sure. Is that our current plan is that this will become the default for all ENS names. So .eth names, subdomains of .eth names, DNS names, everything that when you make it will just be wrapped in this thing, which will um, give them all this new functionality that Jeff mentioned, which is extremely powerful compared to how things are now. It will also put them all into the same NFT collection. So is there any reason for using 721 rather than 1155, uh, Jeff? So, so technically we're actually we're looking into using, we're actually using 1155 right now um, in the new contract, but we want to keep it compatible with 721 as well. So we're kind of adjusting it as well. So it will have some of the uh, 721 API. And then we're also adjusting 1155 so it can be a bit more gas efficient. I think Nick can probably mention a few things about that. If, uh... Yeah, so we're not adjusting 1155 so much as we're uh, changing from the Open Zeppelin um, implementation to our own uh, derived from that. Uh, the reason being that uh, we're really putting a strong emphasis on gas efficiency for something so foundational. And 
we can actually store everything we need inside a single storage slot, uh, but only if we're implementing it ourselves and not relying on the, the Open Zeppelin implementation in, in its entirety. Um, and it won't be 721 compatible, but it will implement the balance of method because, uh, uh, sorry, not balance of, owner of rather, uh, because we have the data to support that and it's useful for smart contracts to be able to simply say who owns this domain rather than asking the question, does this person own this domain? Yeah, okay. uh, and Hadrian, I will uh, <coughs> contact you. Uh, I suspect that this is a case where uh, it's simply impossible to be as gas efficient as we want and still use a, uh, entirely use a common interface because we are packing multiple things into a single storage slot. But it would uh, be an interesting conversation to have anyway. Other quick comment on this that I'm really excited about. So in the current .eth NFT <laughs> implementation, um, we and Nick, please, if I misstate this, please correct me. Uh, we don't, we didn't take advantage of a lot of the metadata possibilities there. So for example, we don't control what the image is that shows up when you see your .eth name as an NFT, but we don't provide anything. And the image you see is actually just something OpenSea created because we just thought we don't need this because we're like names, right? Well, turns out maybe this could be a useful thing. Um, so this new implementation, this wrapper will give us the ability to create a common image for all ENS names and even could give us the ability to make it so that the user could set the image that shows up for that name, which means that ENS names could be basically NF, uh, art NFTs with extra functionality. So like a current art NFT is an NFT that you know has an image attached to it, great. And then an ENS name will be that, but plus all the additional functionality of ENS. So I, I have this personally have this vision of like you could have all NFT art really should just be ENS names because they have they have additional functionality. They automatically have a name and all these other functions. Anyway. Cool. Yeah, I think there's a lot we can talk about this one. So I think once this one gets to the ready state, maybe we, we can organize other events to, to kind of brain, brainstorm the usage. Okay, so the next. Is, so we did, yeah, so we did talk about all the roadmap and so far. And that when I, if you look back to what I mentioned about the uh, finance, so we are in a fortunate situation that fact that we have more than enough money to basically cover our runway. So we did start talking about uh, maybe we could start giving back to the community. So now I want to kind of shift our focus on to kind of sort of grant that idea we've been discussing in the team on and off. And then I just mentioned like why, who, how, and then I think when it gets to like kind of tools and the framework, we we are we we, we would like to ask some other people's experience and expertise. And uh, so why is yeah we we want to give back to community, but at the same time, this could be the good. Depending on how we do, it could incentivize people to fast dApps to integrate uh, more. I think we have like over eighty. Uh, dApps, no more than that, I think, uh, which integrate them, but it's still long. I think wallet are quite good at integrating, exchange is still low. And also I've been looking into the kind uh, of NFT marketplace and they are actually extremely low on the integration. And it's kind of chicken and egg situation that when majority of people don't use that, don't have a ENS name, uh, marketplace have less appetite to integrate so it's kind of both way to kind of incentivize people to use ENS so that and uh, some of the platform I, I heard that like actually user kind of ask the platform to uh, integrate ENS so that some some ways to kind of like increase ENS adoption and also this could be the steps for kind of test casing for the future ENS governance uh, as Nick mentioned like you know we prefer kind of progressive uh, decentralization so it's not that like you know one 
DAO or whatever the framework could rule everything. Probably that's less likely to happen. But like I think this kind of uh, grants giving DAO would be the good starting point to start experimenting. That's kind of why. And uh, so in terms of like who to target, uh, yeah, as I mentioned, like uh, maybe DAPs with ENS integration. We already are giving away uh, bounties for the uh, East Global Hackathons. I think we, we've been giving away around $1,000 uh, worth of ETH for each hackathon. And uh, we also just last week, we experimented partnering with uh, a rabbit hole. So which kind of gamify uh, trying out new dApps. And we kind of say like 100 people, if they support, they set like a ENS for like a forward lookup and reverse lookup, we'll cover, we'll give you $50, which should be sufficient to cover the gas. And we also, I think uh, this is Jeff who suggested that like uh, NFT is really, really taking off for the like, last couple of months. And uh, as ENS is one of the OG on the NFT itself, can we kind of increase the kind of recognition among the NFT community um, or like any other usage we, we want to kind of target? And uh, in terms of like, so that's all about who to give money to. And in terms of like decision making, uh, this is where there's so many different ways. Uh, ma majority of the, uh, I think, uh, DAO and the decentralized DeFi project tend to do like, you know, they tend to have token and they're doing token voting. So many tools are made around the token usage. But at the same time, we do have ENS name as already NFT and something like a snapshot. Like I, you know, I've been doing for the uh, badge voting. That's actually using a strategy uh, using the on-chain logic of whether people has a set a reverse record or not. So you there it is possible in our case of doing some sort of voting and without not even having token. But like it, I guess if logic gets more complex or like if tools don't support, we might want to issue token. But at the same time, this is for grant giving token. So we don't want to encourage any sort of speculation. So that kind of thinking is around needed. And in terms of like, yeah, who's eligible to Kind of make a decision. Uh, the the most how to say most like if you use says entire ENS community that could include anyone who who sets ENS name, including subdomains. Uh, whereas like probably the narrowest would be the people who set reverse record, which is a kind. Of, it's partly due to our. UI on the app side and, and also the fact that you can't do everything in one transaction. Uh, the rate of setting reverse record has been low and uh, I think in average between 10 to 20 percent. The more people set reverse record, that shows up to the site which set integrated reverse record so that more recognition of the ENS name as a whole. So maybe that's an area we want to incentivize. That's one area. And also in terms of vote, uh, voting, uh, there there could be token delegation or quadratic voting based on the number of names they hold or based on the register. I think when I posted this idea, someone said maybe like even for the number of fees they paid in, meaning that if you register for three character names, they, they pay way more. So maybe they may wait more. There's different ways, and uh, yeah, and also governance is the is it, it should be token among all holders, or it should be the, decided by people who donate. And uh, again, this could be narrow or wider. Narrowest, it could be something like Moloch. That Moloch is, I think, there's a couple of people who's in the Moloch community in this uh, session. So I'd like to have to ask. Like you know their experience, but like they usually have like uh they don't have token I think, and they just have kind of share, and then everybody who puts who puts the money is basically the donor, so they decide. Or like Gitcoin grants, which probably most people are familiar with how it works, is that you know the the more people 
donate to the project at the more people uh, i think the more amount it's being matched and yeah in terms of tools framework i think now it got i want to pass back stop presenting and uh, wants to keep asking well, asking questions or like you know uh asking to share opinion but like i think a couple of people who i don't know if people from gitcoin had joined i did invite but i'm not sure if they are happy to i don't i don't see their names so in case of gitcoin uh we have they usually do the matching but i did what well, nick mentioned that like they they were able to target also the project right yeah so so just to give a bit of a, a tldr first the, the, to, to recap we ens is in a fairly good financial position because we've been around for a while uh, there's been a lot of registrations and the ether price has gone up a lot and we'd like to give back to the community and that's either or both in terms of ENS related projects, but also the wider Ethereum community. Uh, in terms of Gitcoin, yes, I was talking to Owaki uh, the other day about this. Uh, and, you know, one alternative to us establishing some sort of grant giving DAO would be to simply uh, join one of the existing ones effectively. And so we were talking about the possibility that ENS could team up with Gitcoin to have a ENS focused Gitcoin round. Uh, where we have a separate matching fund contributed by from the ENS Treasury um, and for which anyone who whose application integrates ENS in some way would be applicable. So if you're working on a Gitcoin grant uh, for anything uh, and your application also integrates ENS in some fashion, you would be viable, uh, eligible for both the general and the ENS matching funds. So potentially uh, double the matching funds, depending on the level of those, the size of those uh, funds um so i guess i'd be i'd be really interested to hear from everyone here what they would really like to see in terms of um like w what do you think the most effective way to uh help you know give back to the ethereum and ENS communities would be with this to to help uh fund building of interesting things uh like a good foundational question there is just like what type of projects do you actually want to support uh, and i guess maybe you be kind of more clear on that uh should they be kind of exclusively public goods projects or uh do, should the ns support uh private goods should they support other projects that are mm -hmm. vc backed profit generating mm -hmm. applications or projects or whatever it is um and i mean you know in any case if you're going the route of, of providing funding to projects that have integrated the ENS in some way, then that's obviously not exclusive of those, those private goods. Um, so yeah, I guess just some clarity on that, I think probably helps to inform everyone here's uh, yep. guidance. Uh, I mean, I guess my own view is that I'd much rather be funding public goods, um, but that I, I also see the point in sort of uh, angel funding is the wrong term but like uh you know people who want to kick something off and need a bit of of help to get it going even if it eventually becomes a commercial project i i guess i i think gitcoin personally does a fairly good job of saying you know um of allowing donors to direct their funds but also of sort of encouraging public goods and encouraging things that that benefit everyone in the long run um and i'd be i'd be tempted to uh somewhat rare their approach if not just work with them outright mm -hmm. hey ben uh, from uh Dow house here can you guys hear me mm -hmm. yep i mean it could be cool i mean i think the the gitcoin thing sounds really neat i mean i don't think it's a it has to be a restrictive or a reductive process i mean i, I would say like especially this early stage of trying to figure out how to like uh, distribute grants and things just do a bunch of small fast experiments. Um, it's pretty easy to spin up like a round with Gitcoin, especially if, you know, with the walkie around. So um, it's, you know, it's, I think the only difference between like that and like a Moloch DAO or something, for example, is is really just who is signaling. Um, where Gitcoin, you know, it would just be anybody. Uh, so there's no real proof of contribution or understanding of ENS. It's just like a free-for-all. 
which is totally valuable and cool. And then a Moloch DAO would be much more like, you know, kind of like you guys would let in some initial community members who are uh, strong signalers and know what's going on and should would drive like how that community would curate itself over time, uh, basically. Uh, and then you guys could just fund it yourselves and then they could distribute that and discuss proposals and do all that stuff together. So yeah, just kind of different processes for different values, I think. I, I'm inclined to agree, uh, and I, uh, I do think that we should try and avoid getting too uh, tied up in the idea of uh, building our own from scratch uh, and, and getting distracted from the actual original goal, which is helping fund and and expand, you know, other projects. Um, so you know, borrowing from these existing projects like Gitcoin and, and Moloch is probably a good thing. I see a few folks with hands up, uh, Mohammed and Gary. Hey, everybody. This is Gary Palmer, Jr. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, hey, Gary. Yes. How are you doing? All right. Very cool. Uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm not sure if this exactly fits into the conversation, but in terms of integrations and adoption and increasing the visibility in, in what ENS is doing inside the ecosystems. And, and I have a lot of love with uh, everything with the um, DNS integration and, and all that stuff, but really focusing on the new. There's a lot of excitement. There's been a lot of hype, obviously, about uh, you know NFTs and um, art NFTs and visual NFTs. And it's starting to shift into you know music NFTs because you know culturally uh, you know the, the art is hot. And uh, I guess what I want to see, you know, in this sort of world that we're living in, this new world um, with um, centralized identity, I'm, I'm really interested in ENS being uh, used as a decentralized identity solution, de decentralized naming solution, obviously. Um, in the traditional, you know, Web 2.0 world, when we wanted to help people, you know, verify their social profile on their web, we just have their, their .com link to the social profile, a social profile link you know, to the dot com and that two way, you know, crossing, you know, was pretty good about, you know, that verification. And I, I'm just wondering how do, you know, places like OpenSea and Rarible, uh, you know, they, they have their own thing going on. But these platforms that are onboarding brand new artists, right? They don't know anything about Ethereum. They don't know anything about blockchain, but they're just signing up with these NFTs. I want to see a world where anyone that creates an NFT, you know, maybe with uh, 1155. You know, it maybe you know that the deck is adapted more. Um, if, if I'm thinking of the right one, but you know, how do uh, how do these platforms that are generating NFTs for artists? How do we get the ENS name to sort of be a signature, like stamped, owned part of the NFT? So when someone wanted to verify, you know, that they, they can see that that cross behavior. Not only would this increase, you know, the overall adoption of ENS, but this would increase the overall number of you know single ownership ens names right because one artist would just want their their one name and I, I sort of see that as like a key part you know with with all we can think about like there's just so many more people that are creating art nfts right now that are then you know proportionally are interested into ethereum so um when they create an art nft how do we you know in the onboarding process is what i'm thinking how do, how do we do, do more integrations there and and sort of that that one for one you know connecting what people are doing you know with decentralized nfts with their name um to help reduce fraud and increase um their own community and all the benefits that ens provides thank you uh i have some kind of view on that like i think in terms of decent using ens as a decentralized entity what we have right now is the use of reverse record uh so that it shows on that, like in different platform, uh, whether it's like a Mintable or OpenSea is good one. And also when people manage multiple uh, keys, it's good to manage it using subdomain so that you can tie in into your identity of the your second level domain. And uh, in terms of, so that's kind of how, but like then how does that tie into grants? My thinking is maybe so, Gitcoin is good for like uh, dApps and also they do like educator and uh, uh, 
community. And what I'd like to see is, yeah, helping onboarding organization to help on both. I think there's a company like Mint Fund. They actually kind of re routinely recruit artists who want, are interested in NFT, but they have no experience for Ethereum or no, don't have ETH at all. They actually pick selection of people and they actually give gas and they basically onboard artists to from knowing nothing to uh, minting fast NFT. Uh, would be interesting if we could kind of fund somebody uh, their effort that like at least for example we help them for covering for the ENS fee or if I think currently even like registering ENS costs like hundred dollars but if Mint Fund has Mint Fund or ESA or something and if they just issue subdomain and they only onboard people to put reverse record or something that itself already help onboarding lots of people and uh, if they keep doing that it would be great for me because i tend to be the one more support person on discord and i tend to spend hours onboarding someone who has no idea of how uh, to you know onboard i literally spend like two hours of like some artist who have no idea so if they can oh you know if we can partner with someone who's doing education and we we can tip in but bundle with like you know as part of that help them get in ENS. That would could be actually uh, interesting ways to help uh, yeah, the community to onboard. Um, I had a bit of opinion on this as well. Uh, I guess your question is kind of two parts. Is one is like how to get artists to integrate with ENS. So when they use platforms, they can kind of, uh, they're easily more ident identifiable. And also the second part was kind of how to, I guess, to reduce fraud. Um, I've had some other pe other NFT artists talk to me a little bit about this as well, about how, um, I guess, verifying social profiles, that kind of thing, and that kind of web of trust. Um, but I think at the same time, that would also require some kind of uh, server that would verify these. I'm not sure if, if, um, if Chainlink could do that with like oracles, um, but maybe this is something we could look into, into funding as well, like these kind of, they're not directly related with ENS, stuff like verification, that kind of thing that, that maybe um, would help with, with fraud. So if we had an artist that had a name and, and that obviously they have the reverse record set up so we know who they are, and then they, they can also verify their social profiles, um, which we all know them from. So that might help as well a little bit um, so that we can discuss that in the future about what kind of projects that would help with this kind of thing to fund as well. Yeah, I think there's, there's kind of two approaches that I can think of that you can take with this. One is um, you can basically replicate Twitter's verified stamp and, and have an entire organization whose job it is is to figure out if this person is really who they say they are and then stick a tick on their profile somewhere. Uh, and the other is to simply encourage people to use the existing ways that convey legitimacy to them to to announce who they are on ENS or on uh, an NFT platform. You know, simply say, well, I know this is the artist because the artist posted on Twitter uh, saying my ENS name is the artist.eth um, or, you know, on their website or on whatever they're most prominent on that's, that's already associated with their brand. Uh, and I think that's the simpler way to approach it um but you know also uh if if somebody has uh, novel ideas around verification and, and doing it then i think that's exactly the sort of thing that we would love to be able to uh help uh fund and promote you know um but i, I also just to go off on a bit of a tangent there um i think it's valuable if we're in a position to help fund and promote general ecosystem initiatives, not just directly related to ENS. Um, because, you know, we, ENS is possible because of a generous grant from the Ethereum Foundation that gave us the, the funding necessary to be more than just me and my spare time. Um, and it would be good to be able to help, you know, pay it forward and do that for, for other things, you know, whatever the next uh, large public good is that we don't know about yet. And yes, uh, as I know, I hope I'm pronouncing your name right, Oren says, uh, these two aren't mutually exclusive. You can build a verification platform and people can use their existing mechanisms.
Uh, we have about five, four or five minutes left. Uh, so one thing I think low hanging fruits is, yeah, uh, I think start trying to do something on the geek point is probably definitely we can do relatively easily because Gitcoin is really good at like taking care of like you know marketing all the stuff and maybe we could talk about some like you know uh onboarding artists that kind of stuff are there anything else we can think of like kickstarting so one thing that uh is is worth looking to a shameless uh plug here i guess for some work that spencer who's also on the call and i have been working on is a uh, project called clear fund which is uh essentially permissionless contract funding uh on chain so a similar mechanism to Gitcoin, but using zero knowledge proofs as uh and a, a system called uh, the minimal anti-collusion infrastructure to create a uh a, Quadratic funding system that uh, is, is, I guess, more permissionless, uh, or at least has very different uh, trust assumptions. Uh, so Spencer uh, right now is, is taking on a project to uh, essentially allow anyone to spin up instances of ClearFund. We've, we've run several funding rounds as a kind of canonical instance of ClearFund, but we want to uh, essentially have it uh, turn into an ecosystem of instances of ClearFund, and so this would be a a really great uh, opportunity to spin up another instance of it that has a, uh, a specific purpose. Uh, or alternatively, uh, in the same way that you talked about uh, contributing to Gitcoin's uh, action pools, potentially then yeah, there's an opportunity to do the same thing and contribute to uh, clear fund matching pools, uh, which are already contributing uh, or uh, allocating that funding out to uh, other Ethereum public goods projects. Yeah, and maybe I guess, yeah, we only have a couple minutes, I guess. You could, uh, I mean, another idea to, to just start with the, yeah, doing something. You could start like a, could spin up a just a Moloch and put, give it some funds and it could, it could spin up all kinds of like, yeah, clear fund, get coin. You could do various different things, but you just, you at least start to have a little body of community members who have some funds to work with, right? And when you get to that zone, all these ideas just pop up and they get done. Um, somewhere starting like that would be, I mean, even just to test it out and see what happens would be really valuable, I think. I guess my biggest concern about Moloch is that it expects that the voting power comes from contributing funds and... Oh, it doesn't have to. So, so is it possible, can you spin... Uh, well, okay, so in that case, we need to find some other way to distribute voting power, uh, which in itself is a potentially contentious issue, or at mm -hmm. least a, a, a difficult one. Um, I think yeah. uh, power, it, it's just in my understanding of Moloch is not about like a, it's more about smaller uh, stakeholder have bigger power by using the rate, uh, rage quit that like, you know, uh, like we could have like, you know, 80% or 90% of all the uh, fund to contribute. But if we, if we, ENS has a big, big fish, doesn't cooperate with some smaller contributor, our all overall budget decrease. So that's the kind of game theory behind uh, Moloch. So I don't, if you restrict you to uh, us to execute the voting part and stuff, I don't know, does that like uh, negate the uh, game of the Moloch itself? What do you even ne need it actually? That, that's a question. Yeah, rage, rage quit wouldn't be like too useful in a, in a in this kind of a grant giving DAO. I mean, like Moloch DAO itself was, you know, funded by uh, various different people who were putting in their own money. In this case, it's more like a project spinning up a grants DAO, which is more like the project is funding it. Um, so, what you would do, you know, with Moloch V two is you would ENS maybe gets like one share, and then a massive amount of loot basically, which is non voting shares. Um, so that all that all that does is, and the community members would have the have the actual voting weight, so they would be able to vote and, and you know distribute funds that are in the DAO and whatever. And if they if any malicious activity did happen, then you guys would have like an exorbitant amount of loot, uh, where you could just like, yeah, you would be able to rage quit if there was like a you know a malicious thing happening or whatever. You guys would just be able to exit with the remaining funds. Uh, basically, if, if that happened. But in the meantime, you would just be putting in funds and the community itself would have pretty much full voting power over that. You're just kind of there as that final oversight. 
just to make sure that, you know, there's not any like high straight up malicious activity. Um, but yeah, rage quit wouldn't be too valuable in this instance. It's not like, because they're not putting in their own funds, so they don't really need ownership over those funds. You're really just like, you know, giving money to the community and letting them vote directly on how to like distribute that around the ecosystem. That makes sense. Cool. Uh, um, I think it, oh yeah, go on. Yeah, I was gonna say, I think we're basically out of time, but just a, a thought to leave everyone with to be cogitating on and maybe contribute back to the, the forum is, um, if we did want to have some sort of DAO, like a Moloch DAO, uh, with community input, uh, how to determine who the community is and who gets votes is is the crucial question. And neither the solution of anyone who comes along gets a vote for asking, nor the solution of you get a vote per domain year you've registered seem very satisfactory for various reasons. So uh, novel and, and useful ideas along those axes would be very much appreciated, I think. Agreed. Yeah, that's, that's what I noted as an area to, to look into more as well. Yeah, yeah. Do you guys have a preference on uh, kind of voting styles? I mean, I don't want to massively reward people for having, you know, registered thousands of domains. Um, but I also uh, don't want to just, you know, allow anyone to to claim an individual identity because that, uh, for a vote, because that degrades the same thing effectively. Um, I don't know a good solution, um, but I think we'll have to solve it out of band. <laughs> yeah, no. yeah, the simple compromise typically these days is like a, a quadratic, um, you know, allocation of shares basically or something uh, based on, you know, so yeah, if you have like, I literally, I definitely do know people with thousands of ENS names. Uh, yeah. So that's great, but you won't, you don't want them to have like an exorbitant amount of power, right? So you can you can limit that with like a quadratic uh, formula basically. Uh, I'd, I'd love to have this conversation, uh, but we'll have to have it on the forum so everyone gets a few minutes break before the next session. Yeah, and then also we can talk at the after party in the Discord channel. But thank you very much for everybody's participation. Thank you. And I'll see, we'll see you in seven minutes. Bye.